Hi, I'm Tim. Please join me in this video as I go over what the FAA could do in terms of fines and violation if you do not comply with remote ID. Let's get to it. This video is being filmed the last week of August 2023, just a little over uh, two weeks, about three weeks from now, remote ID will come into effect on September 16th, 2023. I have a lot of videos on remote ID, as do others, there'll be links in the description. Remote ID is essentially a new regulation from the FAA that all RC models and drones have to have a set of communications, electronics in it that identify the location, various aspects of the flight of the drone or RC model to receivers on the ground. It can be built in the factory as standard uh, remote ID. It can be a remote ID module, like the very new Sky ID model that was released by uh, uh, the folks at Spectrum uh, just a couple of days ago, or you can fly without a remote ID, especially designated free FAA recognized identification areas. But as of September 16th, you have to account for remote ID either flying in a freer or on your RC bottle, helicopter, or drone to legally fly that drone in the United States. So the question comes up, remote ID is a regulation by the FAA. It is a new regulation. Nothing like this has ever happened to the um, drone RC model community. What's the FAA going to do if you simply don't comply with remote ID, if you fly with, without remote ID? Um, it is an individual choice whether or not you choose to follow regulations such as remote ID. <clears throat> I will follow the regulation. I bought my Spectrum Sky ID uh, module the day it came out. <clears throat> it'll be a couple of weeks before um, I can get it, uh, before it'll, it'll, it'll be shipped. But I will be remote ID compliant. But what happens if you are not remote ID compliant? You just say, well, I'm not going to put on the remote ID. What, what is the FAA going to do in terms of something like that? And I'd just like to caveat this entire video. <clears throat> I'm just making this video. I don't work for the FAA. I don't have any connection or correspondence with the FAA. These are just my thoughts, my understanding for over 50 years of dealing with the FAA, both with private and commercial flying. The executive summary for this entire video, if you are not remote ID compliant with your drone or RC model aircraft, assuming you're not doing something dumb, like flying into a police car or um, law enforcement is responding to a complaint. If you're just minding your own business, flying in uncontrolled airspace with your drone, remote ID, the chances of the FAA coming and uh, asking questions or trying to determine whether or not you're compliant with the remote ID regulation are going to be very low. Not zero, but for recreational RC pilots, very low without remote ID. Now, what I'd like to do now is give some background on how the FAA is likely approaching this problem. The FAA is quite new to drones and RC model aircraft and what they're going to do, perhaps more importantly, what they are not going to do in terms of enforcement for the remote ID uh, situation. One thing that is helpful is understanding how the FAA as a general rule goes about enforcement of the regulations. <clears throat> the FAA was formed in 1958 and up until really about now, the um, major focus of their activity was on manned aviation. In other words, aircraft with pilots on board. To fly an airplane with a pilot on board outside of ultralights part 103, you had to go through training, uh, you had to be signed off for a check ride, you had to take a check ride, and you were issued a pilot certificate. Could be for a private pilot, commercial pilot, airline transport, or the new part 107 for drone operators, you had that pilot certificate. And what happens with the FAA, they don't have a large enforcement branch. It's not like a tobacco, um, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, where there might be a fairly uh, well-organized unit to do searches and, and capture people or whatever. The FAA just doesn't have that. They have a series of um, aviation safety inspectors, other people working for the FAA. They may observe an unsafe act. Perhaps the inspectors at an airport sees the pilot landing on a taxiway. And so he will take... Um, action on that violation of a regulation, say careless and reckless operation. There might be a complaint, there might be law enforcement, but generally it'll be a person working with the FAA sees or gets a complaint and decides to take action against that person. Remember the FAA per, regulate, per their regulations, per the law, 
can only impose fines. There's no criminal activity. Criminal charges involve going to jail. The FAA c cannot do that. It can only levy fines. There are rare cases where pilots who violate a regulation do end up in jail, but it has to be something very serious that might involve potentially harming somebody or loss of life. What will happen in the case where pilots go to jail, the FAA will refer that to the FBI. The FBI is the one that will put that pilot in jail. Other than that, the FAA can issue fines, which they have done to include some drone operators. But the big stick that the FAA has really against pilots is taking away their pilot certificate. And a certificate is the same thing as a license. The FAA can either suspend a pilot certificate or it can revoke it if it's really serious. There are challenges and so forth, but pilots have lost their pilot certificate uh, because of some violation of, a, of an FAA regulation. Pilots don't like losing their pilot certificate because they spent a lot of time, energy, and money getting that. You cannot legally fly your airplane without it. Keep in mind, if you're a commercial pilot, say a United Airlines pilot, that um, certificate that you use perhaps to fly your private Cessna on the weekends, if you're involved in a violation, you lose your license for a issue with your Cessna aircraft, you don't have a license. You can no longer fly for United Airlines. So clearly the importance of retaining and keeping that pilot certificate, which the FAA can take away, is a strong guidance on how pilots comply with regulations. And just to uh, fill in some aspects of what I'm talking about, I am talking about recreational flyers for RC model aircraft or drones. These are models that weigh 250 grams or more, that's 8.8 .8 ounces. If your model is less than 250 grams, there are drones out there, for sure, RC model aircraft. You don't have to register those models if they're under 250 grams. Because remote ID is tied to registration, no registration, no remote ID is, is covered for, um, is required for these models. Also, we're talking about recreational flyers. Recreational flyers just fly for their own pleasure. They are not part of the 107. It's a different discussion because with part 107 drones, you do have a license. So let's talk about the recreational flyers. Recreational flyers don't have a license. They just go out and fly. Now, what happened as part of the evolution of the FAA dealing with and getting their arms around drones and small aircraft is the FAA was directed to come up with some sort of test or training for recreational flyers. This is not a certificate, it's not a license, but really for the first time in the history of model aviation, drones, drone pilots operating the national airspace system have to have some type of training. They have to be aware the FAA exists, there's controlled airspace, uncontrolled airspace, maximum altitudes, things like that. That is the trust test. Uh, the trust stands for the recreational UAS safety test. It's an online test. It takes about 45 minutes. You don't have to study for it. It's corrected for 100%. But the trust test is your first real linkage between recreational pilots and the fact that there is airspace rules, regulations, and things of that nature. What's a little bit unusual about the trust test, uh, I shouldn't call it a test, just the trust training, is that it's not a certificate that can be revoked because you're not issued a certificate. It is such a unique thing that if you look at what the FAA says about the trust test, it's really two things. It simply says the law requires that recreational pilots take a tr trust test, so you have to do that, and the recreational flyer must show evidence of that trust test, a print out of certificate to law enforcement or FAA personnel when requested. That's all they say. It is such a unique thing with trust. There is no record in the FAA that you even took the test. You simply take the test. When you pass, you have to print out your certificate. If you lose that trust certificate, you're gonna to have to take the trust test again to get the certificate to prove that you took the test if the FAA um, asks for it. So in a kind of unique situation where with recreational pilots, there is no certificate to revoke. Um, so with remote ID, because there's no certificate to revoke and the fact that you're a recreational flyer, the FAA historically has, will take a very um, light approach towards that. They're just not going to be looking for that, uh, th that area of flying. And that flows into how the FAA approaches flying safety in general. 
Remember, the guidance, the motto of the FAA is to have the world's safest and most, e most efficient aerospace system. And so what the FAA does is it's a risk management approach. Things that are very important, like United Airlines, Delta Airlines, where you have passengers that are just buying a ticket and assuming the airline is safe on their journey, wherever they may be flying, the FAA will put a great deal of attention and effort to make sure those commercial airline operations are safe, Part 121. And that is demonstrated. There has not been a fatal aircraft crash in the United States since 2009. That's a pretty long stretch to have no uh, fatal aircraft accident, so that's doing well. So a lot of work with the commercial flyers, less work with the general aviation flyers. We get down to the drone pilots, recreational pilots, with remote ID, there just isn't a lot of people or time or interest for the recreational flyers to go around checking on a remote ID for a recreational drone, in my opinion. Now keep in mind, outside of the whole remote ID discussion we're having in this video, if you approach other aircraft, if you fly in an unsafe or dangerous uh, manner, if law enforcement wants to make an issue of it, if the FAA sees something he or she really doesn't like, that is a separate discussion. But if you're just kind of minding your own business and you're flying your drone without remote ID on your ranch in Montana and you're staying out of controlled airspace, the assumption is all this flying is uncontrolled airspace, the FAA probably is not going to give you too much of a hard time for that type of flying. So this background raises an interesting question that a lot of people are probably asking, to include myself. <clears throat> if the FAA has taken a very light approach to remote ID for recreational flyers, why have remote ID at all if they're not going to follow up and enforce the regulation? The way the FAA works is they write a bunch of regulations and they just assume that people are following the regulations. If they're not, there's a whole bunch of regulations the FAA can use to fine you and potentially do a certificate action. Those regulations are in place to be used as a scene fit. Perhaps the best example of that is that catch-all careless and reckless operation. That can cover a whole bunch of activities for flying. What is careless and reckless operation? Who knows? It'll depend on the circumstance. But getting back to the remote ID, what has happened, I believe, just as I study this whole remote ID situation, is there are an awful lot of unmanned aircraft flying in the national airspace system. There's kind of two segments. You have the commercial unmanned aircraft uh, industry. In 2023, it's about 29 to $30 billion. Some of these may be carrying passengers with air taxi operations without a pilot on board. And then in that mix, you have recreational flyers and the part 107 that is, I guess, really technically part of the commercial um, flying. Industry sources claim there are up to 7 million drones that have been sold that are flying. And you just have to understand that if a average teenager, somebody in their 20s, buys a drone on Amazon in a Best Buy at a store somewhere, they can open that box, charge up the batteries, and be flying within minutes. They don't have to have a club. They don't need an airfield. They can be every, anywhere. The cameras are excellent on these drones, and they're incentivized to explore to fly in a lot of different areas. And they're doing this flying without any knowledge that the FAA even exists or that regulations may or may not be in place for this flight. Hence the trust test to at least let them know this does exist, um, uh, regulations do exist. But getting back to remote ID, as I study this and read the language, I'm seeing more and more, instead of small unmanned aircraft system in the FAA websites itself, they're starting to just use the term drones, and I think the drones are the concern, quadcopters uh, and so forth, because they go everywhere, they're very easy to fly, and they're taking pictures, so they just they explore. And so what I think happened is Congress, in conversations, direction of the FAA, as part of a very initial first step to try to get their arms around all these drones of the national airspace system, people with very little training, We've got to have some idea where these drones are, thus the concept of remote ID. I don't think in my heart of heart they were too worried about fixed-wing RC pilots. We tend to fly at um, RC clubs and airfields at known locations. We enjoy the camaraderie of being with other pilots. We need runways typically for our models. You just can't take them out in the field and launch them. And so we tend to fly in relatively known locations, hence the FRIA the FAA-recognized identification area. In AFRIA, you don't need any remote ID equipment at all. 
if you're in an approved FRIA. We'll know for sure how many FRIAs have been approved after September 16th. <clears throat> We're probably up to at least 700 by now, uh, the last week of, um, of August. So what to do about remote ID and the drones? Again, it's a, it's a crowd that doesn't follow regulations, may not even know regulations exist. How are we gonna get these people to do remote ID? And I think what the FAA did was really pretty smart, almost bordering on brilliant. They came up with the idea of a standard remote ID. Standard remote ID means that the remote ID is installed in the factory. So as of December 22nd, 2022, that's pretty close to nine months ago, Every drone that was sold in the United States was remote ID compliant with standard remote ID. So whether the people buying this drone know it or not, they are remote ID compliant. If we accept, I'm just going to pick a number out of the air, that the average lifespan of a drone is three years, after another two and a half years, all the older drones remote ID are going to be aged out of the fleet as new ones come in, we will reach a point three or four years from now where essentially 100% of the drones will be remote ID compliant because a remote ID is installed in the factory. Now, I understand some people, build, some people build their own drones. There may be some older drones. If they fly with a remote ID module, they're compliant. If they're not, they're not. But the real concern of the FAA, I think, are these, um, for, for the recreational flyers, these quadcopters, and by having it installed in the factory, it's a pretty interesting end run to have the remote ID just installed. Now, the other question is, is this remote ID going to work? I don't know. Nobody knows. The FAA has what they call means of compliance that are very detailed technical specifications to make sure that you comply with the remote ID requirements. Once a manufacturer accepts a means of compliance and builds something, they have to apply and get what's called a declaration of compliance, which means they are compliant. You can look at this on the FAA website, drones, makes and models, and that means that you're legal per the FAA. If a drone manufacturer says, well, I'm not going to install the standard remote ID, I'm just not going to do it, they will not be able to sell drones in the United States. So it's a very clear incentive to get remote ID up and running um, in the um, recreational fleet. So I view remote ID as a long-term thing. I think it is just going to have to be there for the future of the goal of this whole um, enterprise exercise is completely integrated operations of manned and unmanned uh, aircraft in the national airspace system. So this first generation of remote ID is going to be primitive. It may not work. They may jam each other. There's going to be who knows what's going to happen with interference, real world situations. But what happens, I think we can all agree, the pace of technical change on drones is just incredibly fast. The reason it's incredibly fast is there's a tremendous amount of competition on the drone operators. They want to have the best drones. Um, and through that competition and the fact that the drones are unmanned, they don't have uh, any airworthiness directives, requirements, airworthiness certificates. They can simply build that, deliver it to have something that works better. Also, as remote ID, the technology and the capabilities mature, I think you're going to see other things outside of remote ID come into play that will make it a more useful system for the FAA and law enforcement. The models may not want to hear this, but I think you could almost have a poor man's networked solution with remote ID with outside transponders and equipment that can leverage the existing remote ID to have a more comprehensive understanding of where the drones are. This is kind of what happened with uh, GPS and global positioning system and instrument landing system approaches. When GPS first came out, when the satellites were launched in the mid 1990s, the signals were, were not very good. Um, you could expect with selective um, availability, a, a, an accuracy of about maybe 15 meters for a received GPS signal. That is nowhere uh, good enough to shoot any sort of instrument landing system approach. So what had happened was people saw the utility of someday using GPS for ILS approaches. And what had happened, I'm simplifying greatly, is the FAA produced a WAS. It's a Wide Area Augmentation System. It's a series of very carefully surveyed land stations that, um, and satellites that geosynchronous or, um, orbit that take the existing GPS signal, understand the, ion the, the ionosphere, clock drift, et cetera, 
do a correction signal such that the GPS with a WAS enabled receiver has enough accuracy under three meters to shoot um, precision approaches using the GPS um, using the GPS system. Something like that, an outside corrective signal or transponder or whatever, uh, could be a way to leverage the existing remote ID capability, primitive as it is, into something more useful uh, for what the uh, um, FAA and law enforcement thinks they need in remote ID. So I thank you for tuning in. Again, remote ID, this is being filmed the end of August, is coming in about three weeks. Um, if you are lucky enough to have a FRIA, an FAA recognized identification area at your local um, AMA flying field, you don't have to do anything to be remote ID compliant. Uh, probably the easiest plug and play solution for remote ID module is the Sky ID uh, from Spectrum. It came out, I think on August 25th, and it should be delivered within the next couple of weeks. It looks like you just plug it in and all the magic happens and locks on a GPS on its own. And then, um, where you'll have to decide what you're going to do is if you have a drone that's perhaps a year old, it did not come with standard remote ID um, installed in the factory, you're either going to fly without remote ID or get the module. Uh, that'll be your choice how to do that. I always encourage people to follow the regulations. I think they're there for a reason. But that'll be up to you. And the final thing is, if you are a recreational drone RC model pilot and you are flying outside of a FRIA without remote ID, the FAA, in my opinion, probably has bigger fish to fry than to check to see if you're remote ID compliant. But remember, whether outside of the whole discussion of remote ID, you've got to stay out of controlled airspace unless you have a clearance for that airspace. All of these discussions, free as and so forth, assume flight in uncontrolled airspace. Remember, uncontrolled airspace is Class G airspace. That's where the FAA will not vector any traffic into uncontrolled airspace. That's why we're allowed to fly there. That's why we have the 400 foot altitude. We'll see if that can be improved later on. But um, those are my thoughts on remote ID, where we are, and I'm sure we'll see more developments as we continue this journey with remote ID and RC model aircraft and drones. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.